Hey, everybody, and welcome to the show. I would like to thank everybody for coming out tonight for this special occasion. We can think of this as a not exactly spontaneous because we had it planned for a little while. Uh, Connor Clipping Show. Uh, joining me is our special guest, Dennis Spores of Marshall Enterprises. And for some reason, the names aren't here. So let's put those back up. So, Dennis, thanks very much for, for coming by tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I think my agreement was based on what I saw in Columbus at the recent Buckeye Fest and uh, was very impressed with the organization and uh, and how things were handled. So I was happy to uh, commit to telling you what I know about La Batia. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I will point out, folks that we do have a giveaway this evening, courtesy of Marshall Enterprises. So we'll be doing that later in the show. Um, as you can imagine, there is not an enormous Marshall Games, uh, Marshall Enterprises Games warehouse sitting somewhere in Southern California. So it is in fact a copy of Labatai de Heilsberg, their latest uh, item, which, which I have actually just picked up and which looks very nice. Hopefully we'll get to talking a little bit about Heilsberg later, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna Dennis, I'm gonna start by asking you to kind of give us the story of Marshall Enterprises from the beginning. So this is, you know, back in 1974, 1975 with Larry Groves and La Bataille de la Moscova. And I, I think that was originally like self-published by Larry, basically. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yes, it was. Larry uh, decided that he was going to publish the game. And we, I personally wasn't in a position to contribute monetarily to that adventure, Larry went and printed the games. Uh, we had play tested this thing for about two years. So we had most everything ironed out at that point. Uh, and so Larry went and got it printed. He loaded them up in a van that he bought. He and his wife traveled from convention to convention selling the games. And, um, and eventually he got rid of, uh, was able to sell most all of the copies that he made. I don't remember how many he printed because I, I really wasn't involved in the business. But Can't have been I, many. Yeah, it, it, you know, maybe 1,200 or something like that. And he had a, you know, had a difficult time. It didn't really pencil out for him as far as uh, how much he was spending for gas and motels versus because <laughs> he had kids. He couldn't sleep in the van. So uh, I don't think it really penciled out for him. And when he came back from that, he decided that he was going to relocate and he wanted to, that was going to be it for him. Uh, you know, he'd done his thing and he put it out there and that was it for him. And then Larry moved basically to Northern California. And then later on, um, uh, tragically, Larry was killed in a motorcycle accident. Mm, that I, that did, I knew he had passed. I hadn't known that. Yeah. And uh, by that time, um, that then uh, Game Designer Workshop had contacted him or his wife. I wasn't quite sure how it worked. Anyhow, they paid for the rights to the game and thus went through and did some things, you know, graphically that were a little nicer and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. And then they published that particular game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, I'm pulling the number from memory, but I, I, I want to say 1975 sounds, it might've been 74 yeah. actually, 74, yeah. 75. Cause I know that I, that was, was not, uh, so I mean, GDW was kind of the pioneer of monster wargaming, right? And and yes. Labatai de la Mosca fit right into that. They had already done Drangenach Austin and Untenscheiden uh, or Unentschieden, as I'm coached by my German viewers. Mm, um, okay. Uh, well, I, that, I'm not sure whether that was out yet or not, but. Uh, but well, I, I don't think that any that GDW followed up on that with any additional Labatai titles, although they did do a number of other Napoleonic games. And, and I want to give a shout out to GDW and also to SPI because the genesis for Moscova, we, I, I met Monty uh, Matson and Jim Soto and a number of other people going to a war game club and sitting down every Thursday night. It was at a university I didn't attend. And neither did Monty, but we showed up 
and we played and we really enjoyed playing SPI's Borodino. Mm -hmm. And we played it forward and backward, forward and backward. And then I, I would buy games from uh, GDW and I bought a game called Torgal. Mm -hmm. And it really changed my perspective on, on what these games could be rather than divisional level on a little map. Uh, which was very entertaining, and we enjoyed it. But also, but it could take it into a lot more depth. And I said to the people there that we were with, we used to have a Saturday, Saturday to Sunday war game extravaganza where people would design something and bring it to play. Some of these things were pretty wild. But anyhow, we worked on combining the SPI Borodino game with many of the concepts in Torgau to expand the scale and so forth. And that really was the genesis of that particular game. Hmm. I, yeah, see, I hadn't known that. Uh, that That's fascinating, actually. I I, uh, I mean, I know that Torgau is re regarded as a, an influential classic, but I, I had not known that impact. Um, so that is actually super interesting. Um, so so at, then at some point, you, was was when when Larry was publishing on his own? Was it Marshall Enterprises at the time? It was Marshall, but spelled differently. Mm -hmm. Like it was spelled like Marshall Arts. Right. So before Larry left, I said, you know, Monty and I and Jim are thinking about, you know, we're we're we've we've made a few bucks and we can uh, pay the rent. So maybe we want to publish our own game. And so what Larry did is he gave me his mailing list from the people who had purchased his game and some of the stores that had purchased the game and so forth. So that gave us a foundation to, uh, to then go forward with our first uh, particular uh, publication. But we had a very nice mailing list and some hobby stores that were interested in, in talking to us. And we, we didn't use Larry's name, but I said, we're going to use Marshall Enterprises, but we're going to spell it like Marshall of France. And he said, mm -hmm. okay, have fun. Thematically appropriate too. So, so following that up then, what was the first Marshall, as in Marshall of France, release? Well, it was really the Auerstadt game. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and we were all novices at the whole. Now remember, there's no nobody really is has a computer that does graphics. Mm -hmm. These things are all hand cut. And Monty worked with an artist and developed uh, many of the things that you saw in that game. It was a very simple game, one map, and and graphically, it's it's what it is. But the one thing that I really wanted to do is that I felt like pink and blue counters. We're, weren't really doing it justice, okay? So is there a way that we can make these individual counters look much like the uniforms of the soldiers? So when I look at the Prussians, I know they're Prussians. I know that I, they're not pink Prussians. And the French aren't gray or whatever. And Monty worked very hard with, uh, with graphic people, and we were told over and over again that you can't do this. But, you know, we're... You know, we're not really, we're not really uh, persuaded by that kind of thing. So we kept looking, kept looking, and they found a way to do mechanical separation. So they had film for each color that laid over the top of these things, and and we were able to achieve that particular uh, to get that effect of the the colors of the counters. Hmm. And and so that I think is the first game that has that kind of detail where you really see i mean based on what we have now for computers it looks simplistic but but based on the uniforms and the colors of the troops and how the generals looked and so forth a representation of that on the front side so you know who was coming at you the information exactly about how good they were how they shoot their morale was hidden from you but at least you knew well that's french infantry and mm -hmm. we also wanted to make the common soldiers uh, a fairly simple, fairly simple pattern. And within we made the generals, the guard, the uh, cavalry units much more elaborate because we felt like in all the representations that we see, that's how these armies were. And, and the rank and file soldiers 
you know, while they, you know, they all wore about the same thing, but it, it certainly wasn't elegant. So we, so we, there's a quality difference between the infantry units and some of the artillery, and then the cavalry and the generals and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I am not surprised to hear that it was difficult to arrange that kind of printing process back in that era, which would have been the you know mid to late seventies, right? Nobody else was doing anything like that at the time. Um, certainly not GDW or Avalon Hill or SPI. Um, and I'm not sure anybody was doing, well, I mean, I'm not sure anybody's, uh, uh, only until the last few years have I think we have seen the sort of array of different colors on counters that, that you folks have been doing forever. So, so uh, our stat comes out then, and that actually is one that I have, although I think I have a later version from that, that came out through Clash of Arms. Yeah, we'll, um, talk, we'll talk about how we're connected to, Connected mm -hmm. and not connected to Clash of Arms a little later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what came next then after Auerstadt? Well, then we started looking at, uh, we thought that Auerstadt, we learned a lot from that game. That was the first thing that we put out. And it sold well and people liked it and they made suggestions and so forth. And then we got into looking at Alau. And, and, and we really did our homework with Alau. Now, Larry's rules had evolved with us in particular ways, but the most uh, dramatic of those ways was the treatment of the cavalry. If you go back and look at uh, Larry's original game, the cavalry are sort of like mobile infantry. Mm -hmm. and, and we expanded a lot of concepts and it makes it, that's what makes the game as complicated. If you had all infantry, it'd be easy to play. But the cavalry, as far as charging and resting, different kinds of cavalry, um, all of those kinds of things was what we incorporated and worked on for our shot. And we continued that with Alau. And then we went to, uh, I think the next one is Austerlitz. Alau was very well received. People really liked that game. Mm -hmm. We had, we had some pr technical problems with, because we printed all these colors on the counters, the die strikes, we were having problems mm -hmm. with getting through thicker, stock and you'll notice that in those games like Alau and um Alau and uh Austerlitz and Bagram the counters are thin and I, I and we just couldn't get the stock with the with the printing on it at the time to be able to cut the thing so they mm -hmm. there were they were a little bit thin uh, so that was the progression we went from our shot we learned a lot of lessons uh, we put out Alau, we put out uh, Austerlitz, and we put out Vagram, and those were our three. Within those were three big games. We started mm -hmm. as we always do. We started with something small. We worked on it, and we used that then to launch ourselves into much bigger projects. And so uh, those were fairly big games for their time: uh, Austerlitz and uh, Vagram. And uh, it allows, I think it's four maps, if I remember right. But anyhow, those were the three that we clicked off in succession. And all of those were well-received and very popular. Mm -hmm. Very popular as far as sales go. And also what people what people got. I think it was really, a, a we approached things uh, quite a bit differently. I think it was kind of a breath of fresh air, the way we, the way we write. It isn't so clinical. Uh, Jim does a great job of of that. That's his background, and and the uh, some of the phrasing we put into things and how we look at things and so forth is a little less clinical, perhaps, than some of the other companies. So, um, in in that context, um, uh, would you say that you you that because I I. Like I said, I may have a, I, I may have a, I have got our shot, but I'm not sure it's the Marshall Enterprises our shot. I'm pretty sure it's a later edition through Clash of Arms. Would you say that that way to write rules has remained consistent? You guys are still trying to kind of follow that pattern or, or yes. write in that voice? Yeah, it, it, what Jim said, and, and I completely agree with him, uh, is that is that what we do is the rules are like a novel. And you're going to be a character in a drama. 
-hmm. And so that's the way we approach things. It's not an outline on how to build a lawnmower. All right. So, so you have to get into the spirit of what's going on and understand the background and the history and, and you should really sit down and read War and Peace two or three times and watch the movies and get your mind into it. And uh, that's what we're that's what we we're we're trying to put people in that reference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you guys, uh, 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 1979 sees Talavera come out. Was was that still a Marshall Enterprises product at that? Time? Yeah, yeah, yes, it was. And uh, we we worked a long time on figuring out uh, what to do with. Uh, the British going prone, and uh, and some of the other things that are in that game, but yeah, that was still a Marshall Enterprises game, and that one was that one was very very well received. Also, it's a smaller game, uh, and so maybe a little bit easier for people to handle. One thing I will say is that uh, make clear, and people I don't think understand, even though these are monster games that we put out, I guess you know monster whatever that means, but four maps, five maps, seven maps. Every one of those has scenarios in them that you can sit down and play and you can play in a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the, even though, I mean, even though, even though you have the big game, you have mm -hmm. all kinds of little games within that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the, that's been the case with ev certainly everyone that I've seen. And I've got a couple of old ones. And all the new, the, the newer stuff now. So at least that, that I was able to get a hand, uh, my own hands on in the last year or so. Um, I had picked up the Clash of Arms new Mont Saint Jean maybe a year and a half ago. Just thinking, well, it's the new thing. I, you know, I kind of want to look at the system, and I got it, and I was like, oh, this looks great. And we got to finally play it after only a year. I guess that's pretty good, actually, to be honest. People <laughs> people have this stuff sitting on their shelves for years sometimes, and we had a, had a fabulous time with it. So at, at what point then did Marshall Enterprises decide, hey, we're just going to, you know, we're not, what was the thought process in kind of passing the, the Marshall's baton, as it were, to, to Clash of Arms for a while? Well, Ed bought our games, and and he liked that spirit of what we were doing within the games. I was moving to Detroit from California and, uh, and Jim was getting in his career and he was moving to Los Angeles, if I remember correctly. And so these were kind of pre-internet days, right? Mm -hmm. So then we sort of scattered and we said, uh, you know, it's going to be really hard for us to publish anything else given that. And Ed contacted, I think, Monty and said, well, I'd be interested in buying some of the titles that you have. So Ed didn't buy Marshall Enterprises. That stayed dormant. But mm -hmm. what he did buy is he bought the titles, the rights to the titles mm -hmm. for the games that we had published. And we worked out a financial deal for that. And then he went back and did them in in his style with, uh, you know, the kind of boxes that he has and, and some different graphics and so forth and so on. And, and he percolated different things within the rules and whatnot. And he continued on with that for quite some time, uh, up until we get into the, you know, 2009, 2010 arena. So we mm -hmm. were, we were really out of it. I mean, I have copies of all of the old games and, uh, I have people contact me who buy them on auction or whatever and they want to know if they have everything complete inside and mm -hmm. so if they tell me what they have i can let them know that you're missing something and i will take and i will scan and whatever whatever that's missing and i'll send that to them so anybody who has buys an old game at a flea market or or pays the high price on ebay or whatever and you're challenged to think to figure out, do I do I have a complete game? Do I have all the errata? Do I have all that? I'll give. I can make copies. I can verify, and then I'll anything you're missing, I'll make copies of, and I'll send those to you. And and I do that. I do that probably once a month. I think Noble Knight should be charging you folks a consultant fee to do that. Actually, because I've bought <laughs> I've bought several of mine from there. I know. So so it looks like the transition. Just looking at the chronology of when when came out what came out when it looks like that 
transition to Marsh to, to Clash from Marshall Enterprises to Clash of Arms took place in the early 80s. There's a gap between what looks like Vagram and and the first thing that I believe came out from Clash of Arms, which probably would have been an Albuera. Mm -hmm. So and then, yeah. but then, but then uh I do know that you know for for quite a while anyway um but uh, if you look at the clash of arms box covers they would they would say marshall enterprises labatai de Auerstadt, for example mm -hmm. so so how involved were the three of you at the time when clash of arms was was acting as the publisher i think monty did some things for them uh, monty worked on lutzen he provided some of the structure for that game uh, i didn't really have anything um really no connection to ed at all i don't think that jim did but monty had some connection and then as i say he uh monty made the first uh structure for the lutzen game which ed published mm -hmm. later so mm -hmm. we re okay. really we really didn't have much i think what ed was buying is uh you know and, and he bought the rights to the games but they had been popular and then he could put them out again and and um in a little different style and uh and continue on that sales because people knew of these games that they were from marshall enterprises mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i mean even at that point actually it had been well established by that point that if you wanted to explore tactical napoleonics the standard bearer uh was was going to be labatai even by before clash of arms uh sort of took over that uh, that operation right i mean it, it, there was multiple games out before then so it was it was obvious that uh at least at, at you know at this particular scale if that's what you want to do labatai was where it was at even back then i'll, I'll pull up a question because I, I, I we do know the answer to this and i'll i'll we'll, we'll resume the the narrative story of marshall enterprises in a second but you do still have a few copies of uh labatai de Hausberg remaining correct we do have a few uh jim actually has those in california mm -hmm. and he's the one who's doing the shipping uh mm -hmm. we do the we we have a packing weekend so I fly in from Detroit, Monty's there, Jim comes in from LA, we rent space at a Holiday Inn and a Hilton Garden Inn actually, a Hilton Garden Inn, and uh, we pack games there for a weekend. We pack all 400 that we publish mm -hmm. and we start mailing those out and anything that's left, then Jim typically takes those to LA and that's when we get somebody who requests one or two or three and then mm -hmm. they they dribble out but the vast majority of them are mailed out in a weekend mm -hmm. i yeah i consider myself extremely fortunate to have gotten in on Heilsberg before it's gone and folks once it's gone godspeed trying to get one uh without paying a literal kidney for it on uh the, the secondary market so the, the, I, all, the only the only uh we you know we don't typically sell to retailers that's mm -hmm. not our business it's direct however mm -hmm. there's a couple exceptions and one is noble knight mm -hmm. noble knight gets six games there's a gentleman if you want to know who he is jim will give you the name in china that gets so mm -hmm. many and then we have another retailer i may know him actually and and we have another retailer that gets i think a dozen or something like that in berlin those mm -hmm. are the only three retailers for marshall enterprises everything else comes through our fingers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's uh i guess uh so you know kind of resuming so clash of arms kind of handles the the publishing end of labatai for a number of years and they do a number of uh new editions of previous games that marshall enterprises had done and a number of games that had not been seen before including things like quattro bra and Lenny and uh a new eventually came down, down the pipe a new version of labatai de la Moscova, which is which is real nice by the way yeah, um it's pretty so but then at some point you you folks in in the post internet era decided hey you know we we can we can we can start doing this again because we can talk on the internet and we have technology now we don't well, necessarily need to all be in the same town anymore yeah and 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 i will also say that 
we had prototypes of games that Ed got, and then he took and recast those. Mm. They, you know, they were very um, kind of a first iteration, like Dresden. There was a mm -hmm. first iteration of Dresden that we actually play tested at somebody's house, and Ed was able to get a copy of that. And from then, from that, he took it in and took it in his direction, and then published mm. that. So we really didn't say that let's get back together again. And I was the big person standing in the way of that. Monty called me. Now I'm in Detroit. I've been here for a number of years. I worked for Chrysler Corporation building assembly plants across the United mm. States and in Europe and so forth. So that's, that's kind of my background. And Jim is by this time, he's a vice president for an insurance company at workman's comp and things like that and monty has his own construction company and monty renovates really elegant hotels in southern california so we all kind of have careers okay <laughs> and we all we all have kids and we all have those kinds of things going on and so monty calls me and he says ed wimble contacted him and they're going to play they are going to play uh, he's going to republish uh moscova and uh, it's going to be at Tempe, and he wants to know if we're interested in going. And I said, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think I want to. I don't really have the time, and I haven't played in a long time. And so, no, no, it'll be good. So Monty worked on me, worked the charm on me for a while, and for a while, and for a while. And finally, I said, okay, we'll go to, we'll go to Tempe, and we'll see, uh, you know, we'll sit see what's going on. We'll take a look at the game and so forth. And does Ed want to play? Does he want to have a clash of arms versus Marshall Enterprises throwdown over Moscova? Mm. Uh, and so he did. And Ed put together a team and we put together a team and uh, we studied. I won't say that we don't. We studied the game we, we knew a lot about it, but, you know, uh, it had changed, some things had changed, the orientation of the map, whatever. And, uh, and we nailed down what rules we were going to use for things and so forth and so on. So we showed up to Tempe and we played. And um, it took me, well, I think we played for three or four days. And it took me the first day I was really hesitant about what to do and how to do it and so forth. And by the second day and a couple of, and a couple of uh, beers, then all of a sudden my mind clicked on what I needed to do. And then, and I, I could see that happen with everybody. So, uh, and after, as we were playing and we were enjoying this and remembering what we did and so forth, and it was a good time for us to get back together. We said, well, Marshall Enterprises still exists. Why don't we, why don't we take a look at continuing and mm -hmm. designing games again? So, uh, and, uh, but we had a great game with Ed, uh, and Ed is a good friend. I, I, I visited Ed and he took me around Valley Forge and so forth. And, and, and we get along, you know, there's no, there's no combat between us. Uh, we look at things differently, but we work together and, uh, and we're very cautious about who's has copyrights to things and, mm -hmm. uh, and whose property is what and so forth. We don't, uh, you know, Ed told me he was going to publish Alow. And so, yeah, well, I mean, it's your game. You bought it from us and so forth. This is kind of the direction that we're going. So we don't work closely, but but we work together uh, on things. And, uh, and Ed is a really good friend of all of ours. I've noticed that uh, since, since you brought up Alow, and there's like a number of Alow products kind of coming down the pipeline from a couple of different places. There's there's more than just Winter's Victory from New England Simulations. What kind of goes into the thought process? I, I, I don't know if you guys have decided what your next game is going to be, okay? So if, if you want to tell us that, great. If you're not ready to tell us that, that's fine too. I'm, what, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not ready to. Okay. So, but, but what is kind of the thought process of going into that, of, of deciding what the next game is going to be, right? Because I mean, most of the big battles, the well-known battles at this point have been covered uh, by the Labatai family of games. Well, and, and, and by a lot of other people too. That's true. Well, um, 
the first one, the first thing that I look for, and I'm kind of the advanced man on this stuff. The first thing that I look for is I always ask myself, why would I play this game? If it's a game where I have no chance of winning, I always use I always use the example of building a game about the occupation of the Rhineland by the Germans. Okay, it's one through five, you're successful, and six, roll again. I don't mm -hmm. want to make games like that. I want to have each side have the ability to to win, um, or you know maybe they win part and somebody else wins part. I don't want it to be a slam dunk kind of thing for one mm -hmm. side because I figure why would people want to play that? You know, they it's a competition and and they want a chance to win. The second thing I look at is the dynamics of the game is there's a ratio. I'm going to give away some trade secrets here. There's uh -huh. a ratio of troops to land area. Mm -hmm. And if that if there's too few troops and too much land area where it's all maneuver all over the board, La Batia does not work that well. It's it if that's why some of these battles in the for the French Revolution and, and I really like the French Revolution, but but you have so few troops for such a large land area. Do you want to come and sit down at a convention and spend the first three hours marching onto a board, you know, mm. marching on a board? Or do you want to be able to bring troops in within about an hour that they would be engaged so you can bring them in, deploy them, and then attack with them? So we look at those kinds of things. You're right. Um, most of the big titles, the the you know, Waterloo is a big title, obviously. Mm -hmm. Million games and, about Waterloo. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very popular in uh, well, it's popular in sort of uh, Anglo-Saxon way, but but you know, it's 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 number one on the list, and then people know something about Austerlitz is another big one, and so we hit a lot of the big ones at the beginning, but there are still a lot of very interesting Napoleonic. And, and revolutionary battles, which we may do some mm -hmm. of those too. But, mm -hmm. um, and then we take a look at, well, what's the map area? And then how many troops are there? And then, well, how would that get packaged so that it's acceptable to the customer? I, you know, nobody has unlimited amounts of money. That's one of the things about Leipzig that on one of your shows, I heard somebody say, well, you just, you get the outer ring of Leipzig. But on the first day of Leipzig, all of the battles in that ring were the key items. And mm -hmm. Napoleon didn't do very well at any of those. And so the next day, he folded in, and then he's trying to get across the river as people come, on, come at him. So would somebody want to buy the whole center maps for that, mm -hmm. and then they'd near, not really be able to use them? Or did they want the opportunity to play Leipzig, but to do it sequentially by front? So that you could win a victory up here at Mockern, mm -hmm. and then you could be down on the river over here, and then you, uh, you know, you could work your way around that circle with a variety of games that are linked together, so that how you did in each one determined your victory, and they're big enough where they they fit on the proverbial dining room table, and two to four people can play it. So mm -hmm. there's there's a lot of practical consideration. We've looked at uh, titles that are for games that are available, and uh, and so some just don't work in in the system. But there are still some that do work. They're just not as famous. And if you're history buffs, you like to read about new things and try different things. Of course, you like the famous ones, but. Mm -hmm. But there's there's interesting situations that people had to work into. Uh, one of the other things we like to do is to provide some optional things in these battles that may tip it a little bit one way or another way based on the history. So those mm -hmm. that's that's sort of the uh, loose. Those are the loose rules for how we go about searching for a title, and then we try to see how practical it is. And we, you know, we begin to play test certain things and look at it. But, but we reach a conclusion between the three of us that it has a marketing potential, that it has uh, enough interesting things to write about, 
you know, in our games, we just don't write about the history of the battle. We talk about in, in, in these booklets, the reason they're electronic, they're 180 pages long. And so mm -hmm. it's easier to do it electronic and, and cheaper. But we give the history of what's going on, what the Pope was doing, what, you know, give you a context for play. So we have to have all of that interest. And then we'll, if we did 1807 this year, we're not going to do another 1807 next year. We're going to go to a different year. And so that's why you see us go back and forth because, you know, maybe you don't want to have an Austrian game for five years in a row. You know, maybe you want the Russians or you want the Prussians or you want something else. So those are all the things that we consider. And we also, people give us suggestions, take a look at this or take a look at that. And I do look at those things. You've already done my favorite uh, and I think most fascinating battle and I can't afford it. So that's Asper Nestling. I uh, love it. I love Asper Nestling and it has some of the, I will puff this up. Asper Nestling, you have the battle. You have mm -hmm. some things that were options that they were thinking about, like having Davu do a landing above Asper mm -hmm. Nestling. You have the interaction with the bridge and the burning sawmill. Mm -hmm. because they that's one of the problems they were trying to bring, bring troops across and the austrians were bringing things down the river including mm -hmm. the burnt my favorite rule the burning sawmill and it attacks mm -hmm. the pontoons and breaks it and the troops drown so mm -hmm. i asper nestling you have this huge austrian army you have a small couple of corps the french have and you'd think the austrians could wipe them out but it's hard to deploy all the Austrian army to attack the French. So it mm -hmm. is It is one of my favorite games of the yeah, ones we've done. Fascinating topic. You not only answered my question that I asked, but you answered a question that I was actually going gonna to ask down the line here about, about sort of the unconventional approach that you took to Leipzig, which makes complete sense in the context of what you just said and, and the context of the way Leipzig historically played out, right? Because you're right. It's kind of a, a set of battles in the same on the same map but they're not right next to each other necessarily at the same time um they, they, so that they they really form a circle mm -hmm. where you know where leipzig is they really form a circle and you know those games the first i think three of them we put as free print and play games mm -hmm. on our internet we have free games on there if you have some mm -hmm. uh kindergarten level craft skills you can put together these games and uh, and try out Labatia for free. Well, other than you got to get some tape and stuff like that, but and print them. But mm -hmm. they're smaller games, and we tried some of those, and people played them and came back with with ideas and uh, critiques and so forth. And with, so we we refined those games, but we tried those out on people, and they were uh, they really enjoyed them because you've got. You can play five or six fronts, and depending on how you do on each front, it determines the winner. Mm -hmm. So, so when when you know after that, by the way, that the the whole clash of arms team versus uh, Marshall Enterprises team at board overboard Dino to me sounds awesome. Um, but so after that, you 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 folks had this conversation. What was uh, then the first thing? It looks like the first thing that came out at that point might have been what Friedland. Uh, no, no, we we decided as we as we always do. Uh, we started with something small, mm -hmm. and so we designed Hala or Hall, mm -hmm. if you want, if you will. In in 2012, it we put it on the site for free. It's a game with one French Corps and one Prussian Corps where the French have to cross this river to get into Prussia. And it's mm -hmm. Bernadotte, who isn't in all the other 1806 things. And we put that on there, and we wanted to see what people's reactions were. And the reactions were favorable. And uh, eventually that game won a uh, Roberts Award as the best print and play game for 2012. Mm-hmm. So that was our first thing, and we said, well, you know, um, okay, based on that, uh, remember, we had to relearn some of our some of the skills for this with the graphics, uh, mm -hmm. using computers and so forth with the graphics mm -hmm. and whatnot. So that gave us a that gave us a kind of test to put something out. And the maps is very simple 
on, on Hala. It's, you know, it's, it's very simple when we started out doing the graphics, we've improved a lot from that. But anyhow, that was the first thing that we did. And it was, it was given away to people free. I think, I think we were having a recession then. And so we made it our part of our recession series games mm-hmm. that we were giving people for free. Mm-hmm. So I, I, how much of this stuff is still available for download on the Marshall Enterprises website? Because somebody's going to ask. I know I know there's still at least some stuff. Is, well, is what, what, still what, tends, what tends to happen, you need to go and get whatever's there. I think there's two games there, Ryzen and, mm-hmm. oh, Schoengraben is there, where you, hmm. fight in the, where you fight in the vineyard. But anyhow, I will encourage you to go ahead and download those and get those, because what often happens is that the what was today's free game ends up being republished later on as mm-hmm. part of another package? Mm. Okay, mm-hmm. so so we tend to take the free print and play games and they move up. They that's sort of the uh, that's sort of the triple A league, and we move mm-hmm. them up to the major leagues when we we'll have a game and we'll say, well, we want to add something to this from the same time period, give people a little bit more. And mm-hmm. we'll take one of those smaller games and decide to publish it. So mm-hmm. I think it's Ryzen, which you you talked about. You you said you didn't know a lot about, but that's where yeah. the Austrians send a corps to take Warsaw, and Poniatowski defends. There's some Dutch troops there, mm-hmm. and they desert. And um, some of the Austrian troops desert because they're really Polish. And but it's it's a very interesting game to go through the marshes and cross rivers and so forth. Mm-hmm. And eventually the Austrians do take Warsaw, but anyhow, that that's on there. And then Schoengraben is uh, is a battle with uh, Bagration in rear guard, and he's he's on this hill with his vineyards behind them. That's really difficult to fight in. So the terrain is really complicated and tedious. And so for three quarters of the game, it's tedious. And the last quarter of the game, it's wide open because you break mm. out of the uh, vineyards. And then, you know, Bagration was great at, at having uh, his Jaegers and cavalry and, and holding people back and slowing them down. Those are the two games that are on the site right now. Mm-hmm. Okay, so get them while you can, folks. Uh, after they go away, they, they'll be very expensive to acquire. They, they, they reincarnate. But they reincarnate at additional additional expense, but really they get tossed into what is another game with scenarios. I think mm-hmm. you'll find that most of our big games have a smaller game in in mm-hmm. with them. Mm-hmm. And there are there are multiple scenarios. You know, we we said before, but like Halsberg, which is the one you can actually get right now, unless you win yeah. it here tonight, and then you won't won't have to go buy it. But uh, that that's got I think what five scenarios. Yeah. I think Asper Nestling ha- Asper Nestling has ten. Mm, mm. There's a no, scenario. It's... There's a scenario that's so small that it's uh, rap with some of the young guard against the uh, Austrian grenadiers for the control of a town. And mm. I think the the field itself is maybe ten hexes by ten hexes. Mm. It's something Ideal you, you introductory could... game. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know the the uh, my so my like actual play experience at this point is limited to the noodling around I did with Vauchamp, uh here at home before Buckeye Game Fest and then playing Buckeye Game Fest you know we where we did Mont Saint Jean, um, and, and we'll talk about the rules kind of the, the, the rules contrasts <laughs> in a, in a bit, but because uh, that's a question right I asked Eric at the time uh, you know yeah. on the air and Eric Eric has done a video or two, at least one video on the. The mm-hmm. subject and i kind of want to hear it from you too uh but i want to i want to kind of finish the the sort of story of marshall enterprise now now you know you know on Beauchamp, that was really uh monty and jim were the designers okay. behind that because i was working on leipzig and uh i was working in china and so i had this thing spread out in my room with the with instructions in chinese for the housekeeping staff to stay away and so mm. I was I was designing that, and Monty and Jim really worked on Beauchamp for uh, for the magazine. I wonder, did do you feel like doing that? Right, like having this sort of relatively small it's it's relatively small, but it's not tiny, right? Battle uh, released in a magazine in kind of a digestible format, and I was one of the lucky few that managed to get a copy from 
against the odds like December. Um, do you feel like that rate sort of raised the the awareness of Labatai as a system? I think any, having that extra exposure. Yeah, I think uh, any place that you can bring the game to and introduce it to people uh, is a good thing. And certainly they have a they have an audience. They have a large audience, and it may be different than the audience that we that we uh, normally interact with. So we saw it all as a positive, and you know they're. They're pretty tight with Ed, also. You know, he's mm -hmm. part of that whole that whole group. So uh, mm -hmm. we were we were happy to do that for him. Mm -hmm. I know they're they're separate from Clash of Arms, but they're but they are let's call them buddies with Clash of Arms, right? I I don't know that yeah. it's necessarily even more complicated than that, but I think that Ed does some of their warehousing and stuff like that for them. Something, yeah, something I, like that. Yeah, I don't I don't really know. I just know that they're they're connected to Ed and. And, yeah. uh, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed reached out and then their people reached out to us and we said, yeah, we can, we can work on that. What are you interested in and the size mm -hmm. and how do you want to put it together? And, and mm -hmm. so, uh, but really that was, uh, Monty and, and Jim's, uh, put in the large contribution on that because I was submerged in trying to figure out all these battles in, uh, for Leipzig. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any anything like that on the horizon that uh, uh, I guess I either do you have plans or is there at least talk of of doing like another magazine game in another magazine like in a you know you could talk to Doc Cummins I, he might be delighted to have a Bob a tight game well, in, in strategy and tactics for example well nobody has uh, nobody has really approached us about that we don't actively go out and uh, and and talk to people about that kind of stuff and and other than Ed and maybe the gentleman who uh, I forgot his name that was at GDW they're about the only people that have any idea who we are most of the gaming industry I, I will tell you when I first went back to uh, in 2011 to play Moscova and they mm -hmm. introduced us at uh, at the convention a guy mm -hmm. said to me wow I didn't know you guys were still alive <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the social graces of gamers everywhere that's totally I'm totally unsurprised to hear that somebody <laughs> was crass enough to say that so I don't um, think I don't think people really know who we are or what Marshall Enterprises is, or many times Ed gets questions about our games and mm -hmm. he forwards them over to us. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't comment on his games and he doesn't comment on our games, but people, I don't, there's, there's not a lot of knowledge about who we are because we're not, as I perceive it, really connected into the network of the gaming industry. We're mm -hmm. kind of this, and you came up with a really good phrase for that. You said, these guys are kind of boutique, publishers mm -hmm. and that and that really fit it pretty well mm -hmm. i mean yeah you, you guys 400 copies right that that is the number right that is that's, the number that's a very small print run right and there's not an enormous uh, th there are you know there's more than we think right i'm as i probably got my ear as close to the ground as anybody and uh, I mean, I can't think of that many publishers that kind of uh, exist in that space. And they're, they're all, you know, like they have, they have a, an audience that loves their stuff mm -hmm. and, but the words not really out it, it for a number of reasons, you know, one is just, there's not enough noise, right. And like people like me aren't making enough noise about it or the games are hard to get. And, you know, at, at that economy of scale, obviously it's going to be, you're going to pay a, 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 a higher price too for necessarily what you're getting. Well, um, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push back on that a little bit, because if you look at the number of games within one of our packages, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you look at Ed stuff and so forth, we're really not that far out price-wise. We are more expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, for when you get the package, but if you look inside, there's usually more than one game mm -hmm. in there. Uh, take, for instance, Friedland. You buy Friedland, nah, yeah, you're going to pay some money for it, but also there's the Donzig Siege game in there. So there's mm -hmm. really two complete games. So I mm -hmm. think that there's a lot in our packages, but I won't disagree with you, but they, they do cost a little bit more. I mean, I always like to, I have this... Uh, 
I, I tire of having this discussion with lots of folks. I'm like, ah, oh, that's too expensive. I'm like, well, okay, it is expensive. But if you think about it in terms of the value that comes in the box, right? And as, as long as that value is there, if the game costs $180 or $280, okay. Um, I get to make a decision like a grown up to buy it or not. Uh, if the, the value is there, people will buy it. And if the value is not there, maybe, maybe they won't. And evidently considering that your games vaporize upon contact with the public so often <laughs> apparently the majority opinion is that the the they're getting the value package for for what they're paying for even if it's a little more because you only printed 400 copies as opposed to the may, maybe four to seven thousand that somebody like yeah. gmt might do right well, so, well we we like to say that uh, and this is our sales pitch. You need to buy two copies of everything. That's the first thing. One to play, and then the other one you hold on to because they do better in the, in their price escalation over time mm -hmm. than the stock market or mutual funds or anything. So think of that second game as part of your retirement fund. Yeah, no kidding. You might not have time to play it until your retirement either. In this case, I'm I, I'm like. I consider myself incredibly fortunate that I get the opportunity to play these games. Not all of them, of course. There's, of course, stuff that I'm pretty convinced I'm not going to get to play until I retire. But uh, but I've gotten the opportunity to play a lot of these big games, and I, I think that's super valuable. Um, and some big packages that have smaller value uh, products in them that you can play in a sitting or a weekend or or whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you guys started then with Hala. And I, I could swear I remember when that came out. Uh, I think it's, you know, we, I think it's like Hollis about 2012. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's B, BGG says it's 2011 and you're probably right because BGG is not hundred percent reliable on this. Um, as I've learned to my enormous annoyance over the last six months, but, um, so, and then it kind of, it kind of sounds like you guys leapt into the Leipzig project with that number of smaller engagements around the ring of Leipzig and then put all that together. The Leipzig is seven maps. Mm. So it's not small. Mm -hmm. And uh, each one of those battles typically is, you know, the maps are, are fairly substantial, but mm -hmm. that game, is, that game is seven maps. And let me see here. Jim did some nice things for me. It's seven maps. It has 20 scenarios. And where's my other page here? It has uh, blah, 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 a lot of blah, scenarios. Blah, blah, blah. Well, it is because each battle has its own, mm -hmm. uh, its own scenarios. And then mm -hmm. that comes with 185 virtual book of rules, articles, and commentary. Mm -hmm. so, so you won't be bored. Mm -hmm. But seven mm -hmm. seven maps is still a con it's six counter sheets. So there's twenty five hundred counters in that. That's a, a lot of counters. Well, they had a lot of army there. So mm -hmm. yeah, no kidding. So uh, if you if you look at it commercially, would it make sense then to include the center section? And then if you're going to say okay, it does. There's an army as a core. I think it's von Bulo. He arrives like on the third day and forces the gate and goes toward the river. So then you'd have to expand it even more. You could be up to 15 or 16 maps of which probably seven or eight you would really use. Mm -hmm. So right. those are the, that's the balance that you have to have. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I really hadn't thought of that, but that, that makes complete sense from the perspective of how do you put, I, I mean, remember the scale here, right? Uh, Library of Napoleonic Battles can get that whole thing on two maps. And, and in that case, great. But those are those units are brigades and divisions. In this case, you know the 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 scale is is battalions for the most part, and some government. Yeah, and and usually it's around a hundred to hundred and twenty meters a hex. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a considerable area. So mm -hmm. I have a I have a table. I live in an old house, and in the drying room of the basement, which is where they used to hang the laundry. Mm. Uh, back, my house is a hundred years old. I. It's a big, long area. So when people say, well, who has a table big enough to play these things? My table is uh, 16 feet long and five feet wide. And that's where all these things get designed. So I do have a table I can put it all on. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to fit a table. I'm, I'm still in the process of game room construction. I bought the carpet today, so oh, uh, so it's it's it was it's not a, not fancy carpet. It's those indoor outdoor six by nine rugs. I bought three of them. They're going under there. Hopefully, it'll keep the echo down at least. But I yeah, we we just bought a house in August, so I'm was I'm fortunate to have this fabulous soundproof studio to record in. And right beyond that door is the is the it's it's currently the game room. It's just not ready yet. But uh, but I will have the space to set up any Labatai game in in that room once it is ready. And I have. Oh, that's great. And it's great to have a, a room dedicated to do just yeah. that. Yeah, I can exactly. let stuff set up down there and I have mm -hmm. all of the reference books and it's all complete. So I can mm -hmm. go down there and. Uh, and work away until my wife calls out that she needs me for something. Uh, yeah, that's basic, basically what happens here too. <laughs> so, so the in that case, the um, so you guys did the sort of the Leipzig uh, sort of set of of connected games, and then the the next one I remember because I didn't know about Vauchamp until I saw it on a table. It, it, oddly enough, ironically, Compass Expo. A couple of years ago, I'm like, oh, what, what this is a thing. I got to investigate this. Um, the next one I became aware of, I think, was Bautzen. Um, and that came but, out, what, about 2015, 2016? Uh, let me like see. That. On my Jim gave me a list here because I, I lose track. Bautzen came out. There's Berlin. Bautzen came out in 2019. Yeah. But there's, okay, so but there's a bunch of games that I in missed between in there. there. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch you missed. pile of stuff. And you guys redid Austerlitz as well. It looks like right, right. We 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 worked out with Ed. He had the rights to that. We worked out a deal with Ed, and then we went back and redid Austerlitz. I always felt bad. The counters were so thin. I, it wasn't mm. anything I could do about that. But so we went back and we redid that game. And uh, but but right after we did uh, Leipzig, then Monty came up with the idea that we should do Friedland. He thought that that was a really good battle, and uh, and it didn't have a lot of map to it. I think it's I, I don't think it's uh, I don't remember, but I, I think it's like four maps or something like that. So it's not huge, and the counter density for the maps is good, and so uh, so that we did that. I felt like we needed to add something to the package, and what I proposed to do was not do a La Patia game, I would do a La Siege game. And so I researched the Siege of Danzig, which had to happen before Napoleon could do these other things. And so that's really a departure. It has a La Patia game in it, but there are also siege rules about getting to the city and, and getting into the city. And there's a ship in it that fires. There's a British frigate that goes up and down the estuary and shoots at mm -hmm. people and so forth. So we created that and we packaged that in 2014. So you mm -hmm. get you get Friedland, the big battle, and then you get the Siege mm -hmm. of Danzig, which I don't think a lot of people know about. I think that's kind of a hidden gem, but it's very interesting uh, what they did and how they did it to defeat. And the Prussians were much better there than they had been, uh, you know, in 1806. They performed much better at the siege. I don't know how they could perform worse, but right. but, they, but they they performed much better, and there even was a Russian uh, contingent that tried to come down and liberate the city that the French had to uh, to beat back. They came because the way Danzig is, and then you have kind of an estuary in the sea, and you go up the coast and you get to Königsberg and so forth. So it's easy to transfer people from where the Prussians were down to Danzig. Because uh, you know the French didn't have much control over the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, that just adds another wrinkle to a package, and we felt like that would be a an alternative. I don't know how many people play that or understand it, but you get two different games in that package. War gamers have a kind of a funny relation. I've talked about this on the Monday show from time to time, and I think we hit it last week actually, because we talked about the Crimean War, which has of course an extended siege at Sevastopol. And wargamers seem to have a funny relationship with siege games in that they aren't sure how to design them, which is fair, right? It, it can be challenging to to get an entertaining pastime out of that situation necessarily. Oh, these guys are starving out here. 
these guys are digging trenches out here, not necessarily engaging gameplay uh, unless there's something else happening, like large scale maneuvers, you know, out in the field. Um, so yeah, I mean, but, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that you're able to like, just slip that in as a value add to an already pretty big game about a pretty big battle, right? Friedland's not a, not a minor skirmish after all. No, no, it's really not. But there are a lot of things to do in these sieges. One side doesn't just sit in the fortress and the other mm -hmm. side digs there. There were many sorties that the Prussians launched against the French as they were digging their, their way out. And there were battles outside of the city for, to control different areas that then mm -hmm. give you access and control over the city. So it's not a matter of one side's in, in a cage and the mm -hmm. other one's digging a trench to them. There's a lot mm -hmm. of different things going on that uh, before you can get the Prussians to surrender. Certainly in this particular siege, yeah. Um, and you're, you're right. I'm not sure how they could have performed worse than getting their commanding general shot in the face in the first two hours of the battle. <laughs> um, so at least that didn't happen. Uh, folks, I would like to, uh, Dennis, if you're ready, I think we could, we, we're an hour in at this point, so I think we're ready to do a giveaway. So folks, the way this is going to work is the way that giveaways usually work around here. I'm going to put up a code that you're going to enter into the chat to be enter into the drawing, uh, for a copy of Labatai de Hausberg, which has probably less than 40 copies in the wild at this point. So you consider yourself very lucky if you win, uh, thanks to Marshall Enterprises for offering the giveaway. And if you win, you are going to email me at ardwolfslayer at gmail.com. That email address is in the ticker below with your name and the address and the two have to match. It has to be the name on the address. And then I will <laughs> forward that email. There's, there's been problems in the past. Uh, then I will forward that email on to information on to Marshall Enterprises and they will get your game shipped out pretty pronto. And and if my experience ordering from you guys in the last few weeks has been anything, James, James got my out, my order out like 24 hours. So, um, so with that in mind, we'll let this run for a few minutes so people can can pick it up. But you are going to type in hashtag Labat L A B A T in the chat for a chance to win Labatite to Halsberg. So this is a thanks, you know, to uh, thanks again to to Dennis and and uh, Monty and Jim for offering this. This was their idea, not mine. I didn't ask. Um, just as a thanks to everybody coming out tonight. So hashtag Labat in the chat. So uh, what? So you guys did, you, you redid Austerlitz, right? And then it looks like there's a 27 release that's like four kind of smaller games combined into one set, uh, which include, uh, what, what, did we, what did we have here? Uh, it's Zalfeld, uh, has a oh, yeah. Uh, Yena, which, you know, is a, is a thing. It's like, that's where that's, I figured it finally figured out that way. Wait, I got our stat. Where's, where's the Yena, right? Yeah. Um, which is if, if for those, if I, I would be shocked if anybody watching this show doesn't know this, you know, the story of the twin battles, Napoleon wanted to call it the twin battles, but really Davu was on his own, uh, winning against the bulk of the Prussian army under, uh, Duke of Brunswick, who got shot between the eyes or through both eyes, I believe, in the, early on in the battle, and was carted off and, and did not recover miraculously from that that injury. And then, of course, the King of Prussia has to take over, and that's I think King Frederick Wilhelm, and he's not not that sharp, so not no, exactly he's, a military he's, he's a, genius. He's a good guy at parties, but probably not to run an army. Right, right. They should have put Louise in charge. Actually, it yeah, be the Queen, the Kernigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that would that would be better. Yeah. So, that, what, the... so what we did is we created, uh, we felt like there were some interesting battles in addition to Yena. Mm -hmm. And so there's an initial conflict at Zafelt. Mm -hmm. And I think the gentleman's name is Lewis. He was more a, muni uh, mm -hmm. uh, a musician than he was a, a mm -hmm. general. But anyhow, that's one of the first encounters. So that's a small game. And that's called Zalfeld. And then mm -hmm. we did the Jena game. And then we also created our own version of Auerstadt, but it's called by the other name, which is Hassenhausen. Mm -hmm. And then we included our, as I said, our print and play game, Hala, mm -hmm. went in there. And then we said, well, you know, Jena is kind of overloaded 
for the French. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what if, uh, you know, what if Davout didn't get lost mm -hmm. or he didn't go in that direction? He was with Napoleon and the Prussian army stayed together. What would the result be? We have all the mm -hmm. troops. We have the map. We just have to mm -hmm. put them together in the right order. So we came up with this idea of Super Yena, where all the mm -hmm. Prussians are there and all of the French are there. Huh. And uh, and it's still a difficult game for the Prussians, but uh, but it's uh, a little bit more of a contest than the actual Yena was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a what if kind of game. And I, that I, I, Bernadotte's still not there, I assume. Yeah, he's 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 off somewhere. He's but off with somewhere. that with that uh, you get for that whole thing you get eight maps and five counter sheets, and the booklet is. Uh, is 163 pages and it, it again it it's got a lot of not just military things but cultural things and so mm -hmm. forth is in there mm -hmm. oh here's yeah. see this is why we hired james right here mm -hmm. this is why it's my partner is he saves my my bacon by talking about lewis he invented the piano octet which is mm -hmm. an important thing to understand mm -hmm. yeah see i didn't i i don't know i don't know nothing about music from ah. the standpoint of what a piano octet is. I assume that's like eight pianos playing together. Maybe I have no idea. <laughs> but I do know about Lewis, the talented young composer that got himself killed at Zalfeld. So yeah. uh because that is a you know that is a part of the the tapestry of the history of the Napoleonic Wars. Well see when you play these things you need to put on there's uh there's some you can get all of Beethoven's piano concertos. Mm -hmm. And put them all together. It's like three and a half hours long, mm -hmm. and it just goes on and on and on. And that's your background music as you're playing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's co completely suitable and in uh, in the correct period as well, as I recall. So, well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, I think Beethoven was furious when uh, Napoleon was crowned emperor. However, as I as I recall, yeah, he wanted to he wanted to think of him more as a hero, and getting crowned emperor to him really did wasn't. That wasn't the direction that he thought they should be headed. Mm -hmm. So, so, so after um, after uh, the, the the package that is the four, the four battles of the eighteen oh six campaign, you guys decided to handle kind of one of the biggest battles in the period, right? But with Wagram, yes, uh, that's an enormous and enormously important battle. It's the decisive battle of that entire year for the most part. Um, it happens after Asper Nestling, like a uh, four or six weeks later, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I recall. Um, and in this case, Napoleon has has crossed the river and he's able to face Archduke, Char Archduke Charles, and and it's a it's a contest. Um, it's not just a walk for the French. Yeah, not at all. We uh, we played this at Consim. It, again, it's six maps and seven counter sheets. We played this at Consim. And while the gentleman who was handling, I was on the French side, I, I think I was Oudinot, uh, but uh, the gentleman who was handling Davout was having some struggles getting across the stream. Mm -hmm. And while that was happening, then Eric uh, somehow, somehow shanghaied some grenadiers and uh, some cuirassiers, and he went about hammering the Saxons and mm. about, rout about routed them out of the game. So it is difficult for the French and, uh, and difficult for the Austrians. And it's a good game. And that it brings me to another subject that I, I wanted to share with you. And that is when you play these games, each army plays differently. Mm -hmm. You cannot play the Prussians like the French. Mm -hmm. And you certainly can't play the Austrians like the French. If you look at their ratios of infantry to artillery to cavalry, you'll rapidly see the Austrians are an infantry army. Mm -hmm. And so what you develop has to, and they have big battalions. And so your tactics have to evolve around that, which is completely different than the way that you play the French. So that's just a player's hint to people. Don't try to play the French for every army. It won't work. Mm -hmm. That holds true. I mean, I'll, I can actually vouch for that. Believe it, believe it or not, even given my relatively limited experience, because we saw that on the table at at Mont Saint Jean, right? Um, where it, it, not only do the French play very differently than the British do, but the British play very different than the Dutch and the Hanoverians and the 
Braunschweigers and the other assorted allies <laughs> that are with that army, right? They, 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 we, and that's something that we saw in our game is that is they had that entire uh, Anglo allied right wing was, was until they rushed some British, some slightly stouter British troops in there. It's a lot of big units, but a lot of real brittle units um, and repeated French cavalry charges threatened to blow that entire flank wide open. And, so and that, how, that's something that we saw. And how you use the artillery with the infantry varies from mm -hmm. army to army. So mm -hmm. when yeah. people are looking at play testing and, and, and doing some solitaire, try some different combinations of things. Uh, don't just assume because you played the French, that'll work for every army. Mm -hmm. And in my case, uh, how you use the, how I use the artillery is poorly. So I was not, not particularly pleased with my, with my performance running the artillery uh, on the, on the French left. I did better, a lot better. I was much more, I was, I don't want to say nervous, but I was, I was much less confident <laughs> in my ability to be successful with the cavalry. Ah. Uh, and I'm happy to report that 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 went okay. I was I was very happy with my performance with the cavalry. It, it, only very late in our play did I manage to like actually begin to leverage the artillery in, in uh, anything like an effective way. Uh, yeah, it it kind of took me some time to kind of figure out the dynamic of of how it was supposed to work. It's always the question if you're going to centralize it or you're going to decentralize it. Mm -hmm. You know, is it going to mm -hmm. support the infantry directly or are you going to centralize it around maybe some artillery leaders and set mm -hmm. up something where you can pound a certain position? And so mm -hmm. you, really have battery, to, yeah. Yeah, you really have to look at what works best for your for that particular army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. Uh, hashtag Labatt. I'm I'm issuing a last call on this. We'll give another couple of minutes. Hashtag Labatt to win a copy of Labatide to Hausberg the latest from Marshall Enterprises. Uh, we'll be pushing the button in just a couple of minutes. That's a really good point, Dennis, about how the armies play so differently because that, that is something that I totally saw, right? And it, as the Prussians begin to arrive, they behave differently as well. So you... not having seen the uh, Labatai featuring Austrians or Russians yet, I can totally believe that. And that's got to be a feature of the period because historically that was true right these are different Correct. armies they behave differently they had different they, they have different compositions and different doctrines um there were some commonalities certainly but for any napoleonic game you don't want all the nations to play identically and i think yeah. any good napoleonic game that's the, that 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 something is probably on the designer's mind and even within the French, a lot of their Confederation troops, you know, these mm. uh, Rhinebund divisions and so forth, they they have a mixture of people that are linear. Some of the mm. some of the troops are linear, and some of them fight like the French. And so, even mm. within the French side with their allies, there can be variances. In I'm not saying you can't play that way. Mm. I'm just saying to get the most out of the troops, you really need to investigate. How do you fight in line? Can you fight a mm -hmm. whole game in line? Or should you always be in column? Well, mm -hmm. how do you going to handle your artillery to best support what you're doing? Those are all just questions you can, I encourage people to play scenarios and try different things mm -hmm. and see how that works and understand the flexibility that you might have. Mm -hmm. And and I'll point out that, uh, for, for I, I know Dennis knows this, but that situation that the Anglo allied army is in where it's this multinational force is a situation that is mirrored on the French side at not at Waterloo, but at various times during the Napoleonic wars, it was the case at Leipzig. It was the case at Bordino, for example. So, um, there's, and there's kind of a lot of material on that. Let me ask, uh, yeah, I think we, I, I guess let me let me skip over to Heilsburg because that is kind of the latest release, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Okay. Um, and in the meantime, you guys, you know, I'll, I'll just mention that you had done, you know, Vagram, huge battle, Bautzen, which is, I'm not sure how many, how, I'm not sure if it's a big battle in terms of number of troops, but it's definitely spread out over a pretty large area. Seven um, maps, seven maps, and seven counter sheets. Yeah. It's a, okay. That's it's, pretty big. It's a it's a big one. It's okay. A, it's a big one. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's 
yeah. So, I mean, that's the biggest battle before Leipzig, as I recall. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's so. massive. It's massive. Okay. And then you guys did Berlin as well. Yeah, what we did is we looked at 1813 and we said, okay, what hasn't really been covered that well? And we said, well, Napoleon made two attempts to go after Berlin. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think if we sold Denevitz by itself or we mm -hmm. sold Gross Beeren by itself, that that would really, you know, that that would be enough. But if we put the two together, they have a lot of the same armies. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we've got common armies. They ch the Prussians changed their structure a little bit. Uh, and we can come up they with different have. maps. Yeah, they come up with different <laughs> different uh, maps. And so we decided to combine those two. And, and, uh, and then we put in another little game where uh, the French are trying to withdraw from a city and they're trying to retreat westward and they're being pursued by a, a whole pack of only Landwehr. And hmm. so you've got the French troops, they're kind of disciplined, and you've got these hordes of Landwehr coming after them. And, you know, the Landwehr can fight well or not fight well. You just never know. And so that's a little game. And, again, that's a game you can get out and, and understand the rules. And, uh, and, and, you know, the rules change a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, 18, 1805 is different than 1813 as far as the units and when they, when they check morales and things like that. But it's a good... We always try to put a good starter game and everything that you can mm -hmm. just kind of get an idea of what's going on. And, and you know, I'm a big fan of the Landwehr. They're my favorite. They're my favorite Napoleonic troop. So I'm into it. I don't. I don't care if they have. A, I don't care if they have a morale of 53. I'm going to win anyhow. <laughs> the uh, well, you know, no matter how small the print run, every one of these somebody buying one of those games. Uh, out of each of the small print runs for for a Marshall Enterprises game for for somebody, it's their first Labatai game. Mm -hmm. So I think that's prop that's that's prudent to do that. I mean, you can always play the big thing if you want, right? The big thing's in there. Um, so tell us about Heilsberg because that is, I know it's it's uh, like a week or two before Friedland. Yes, um, and it's a decent sized battle as i recall but it's not a battle that it, it, it kind of gets uh all the air sucked out of the room right between i several months before six months before uh, four months before uh and friedland just a few days later um so i feel like this is a relatively obscure battle it is but there's a hundred and seventy five thousand people there mm -hmm. it, and the game's not small no, and, and there are only two maps, so you know there's mm -hmm. quite a quite a counter density. What I look at it as, and this was one that Monty brought forward, and and he sort of uh, made the pitch for it. And what I see is it's kind of a pattern for Moscova. The mm -hmm. Russians take and they build redoubts, and mm -hmm. these redoubts can see everything, and they put this incredible Lycorn artillery in there that they can basically hit whatever they want to, and and so they. They they set up their de an active defense with these mm -hmm. redoubts and fletches and so forth <clears throat> that that uh, are able to interconnect their fire much like they do at Mon in Moscova mm -hmm. and then the French come on but the French tend to come on kind of piecemeal against this and so they don't really the French don't really do that well in this particular battle and then eventually Benningson says. Okay, well, Dubu's coming down from the north. I'm going to get outflanked. I've stood here a whole day. I've pounded the French army, and then he's going to retreat. The French did capture some of the redoubts in the evening and got pushed back and so forth. But uh, it's it's there's a lot of elements to it that are like Borodino, uh, mm -hmm. that that uh, with with the redoubt, and then there's a river that is that uh, divides part of the uh, part of the battlefield that has some bridges, but as the French attack the redoubts, the Russians are able to set up artillery that's perpendicular to their line of march. So the French are getting shot at from two sides. So that's the main battle. But like all our games, there's an there's several initial battles where Marat goes after regression and tries to take towns and then there's an intermediate battle where both sides pour in a bunch of cavalry and then there's the there's a big battle which when they finally uh, uh 
push back all of the Russians, then they can they try to take these redoubts. And that's we played that game. Uh, both Eric had a game going, and uh, Jim had a game going that I played in at the Dallas uh, Consim Convention. Mm -hmm. And it was real interesting to see how the two teams went at it. And um, but it was it's a very even contest, and and there you really need to figure out the artillery rules. It's crucial for the Russians and crucial for the French. There's not a I lot of imagine. there's not a lot of maneuver. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, we are going to do the drawing. So uh, you probably are out of time if you haven't put hashtag Labat into the chat yet. So I am about to push the button and we will determine who the lucky, lucky winner is for tonight's very generous giveaway, uh, courtesy Marshall Enterprises. Perry Spir Spiropolis. Perry Spiropolis is our winner tonight. So congrats, Perry. Please email me at ardwolfslayer at gmail.com. The email address is in the ticker if you, because uh, I'm not going to spell it off. Um, so email me with your name and address, and we will get, assuming Perry Spiropolis is, in fact, your name, uh, then we will get that information over to Marshall Enterprises, and they can get a very, very nice copy of Halsberg out to you pronto. I so, think Jim, I, I think well, Jim will get that out to them, and uh, I don't know, maybe we'll make, we'll find a, a town and maybe we'll make Perry the prince of that town on there you go. an honorary title. There you go. So congrats to Perry for your, your impending princedom, <laughs> as well as the, the delightful copy of Lava Tide to Hausberg that you're about to take a look at. It's 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 really a nice uh, a nice package, and I'm fairly impressed with it. Somebody actually asked, let me ask it like a physical production question, because I was wondering this as well. The counters are a little bit unconventional um, in that they're 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 cut different than most war game counter sheets but i assume that to be just a function of uh, a smaller print run but they're also very glossy was that like an intentional decision or it's just a side effect of the process or well we wanted to make it glossy and and, and you know i think it relates to the to the class of people that we used to play with there were mm -hmm. a number of beer spills on the counters uh -huh. and so we wanted to we wanted to i know people drink less now they're a little older but still that's in them to uh, tip a glass once in a while. And so Monty has put this coating on everything so that uh, it looks very nice, but also it should the worst happen, then, uh, you know, the counters are protected. And, and one, and that reminds me of one other thing. Many of the people who buy the game buy an extra set of counters that are available. And mm -hmm. so therefore you can play the game, but also, hmm. I can't imagine anyone would want to sell it. But if you decide to do that, what you basically have, you have the game and you have counters that haven't been broken out. So mm -hmm. that's a number of people avail themselves of that opportunity. I mean, I I wouldn't want to sell any of my Lava Tie games, but I could, I could sympathize with somebody who looks at what they're going for on eBay and, and, and is tempted to sell them. Let me put it that way. Particularly and, the and, Marshall Enterprises titles. And then you can uh, rest assured, even if there's some guacamole on your thumb when you're moving the old guard, you'll be able to clean it off. It won't permanently stain them. You do not want to get guacamole on the old guard. I can I can attest to that. The old guard probably doesn't even know what guacamole is. They'll be like, what's, what is this? Sacra blue. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me, because, uh, you know, the big, the big thing that comes up whenever we talk about Labatai, and this is like not the Labatai folks talking about Labatai. This is about war gamers who are aware of Labatai, maybe have dabbled in it a little bit, but but usually not. Uh, because let's face it, Clash of Arms is not exactly IBM either, right? So um the the the, the, the perennial topic that always comes up is kind of the different rules sets. So uh, I, I'd like you to kind of and I know we've answered this question before. I've answered this question now because I consider myself at least well informed to give a, a half of an answer. Uh, and we've, you know, we've had Eric on the show before and have had him give an answer as well. And but I kind of want to hear it from you as to what you see as the primary or most important differences between the premier rules that are used in the or that come with the Marshall Enterprises games. Right? You could use whatever rules you want uh, versus the current rule sets that clash of arms is doing what do you what do you think are the 
the big highlight differences between those systems? Um, well, the premier rules, I'll just say this. Um, the premier rules are one of the longest standing, as this series is, one of the longest standing series in wargaming history. Mm -hmm. You realize if it was in the 70s when we were doing this, and this is 2023, you're looking at you're looking at 50 years of mm -hmm. uh, con you know of, of production and so forth. So mm -hmm. so that's cool. Now, it, of course, we're not the we're not the generator of additional rule sets. Mm -hmm. We stick with the premier rules. They're they're they catch my typos once in a while after we we've read these things 400 times and we'll find a typo or whatever. Or we'll get something where the language, somebody was a little unclear and we clarify. But basically, they've stayed the same March and forward. What changes is the uh, for the specific battle, terrain changes, mm -hmm. troops change, those kinds of things. Um, so uh, I have played the other rule sets. And I, um, not just from pride of authorship, but I... I I, you know, I don't want to, people design things and it's, it's their baby, but I, I just find it basically they're adding many things in and say, well, wow, wouldn't it be nice to have this? And wouldn't it be nice to have this? And wouldn't it be nice to have this? And, and, and I don't think they understand what the scale of the game is and mm -hmm. really how it's put together. But uh, so they add different things that they that they don't think are really in the game. And some of them aren't in the game, but I don't know that they really uh, add anything to the game. So, but Ed has evolved these things. He felt like putting in many of these things like wagons and different things uh, were, were important. Um, our goal, and I'm not gonna speak to somebody else's product, okay? Mm -hmm. But our, our goal, is that you can sit down with one of our games you can sit down with three or four other people and you can play through the entire battle in mm -hmm. as like at a convention you know if mm -hmm. we really sit if you really play per the premier rules and i'll mention the most important one but if you really play that way you will get to a battle conclusion and you will have so many losses and things will happen that happens mm -hmm in the same way in the other rule sets, but some of those work better for solitaire play. But as far mm -hmm. as playing in a convention and playing with a number of people, I think that the premier rules do a better job. The one thing that people cut out, and even the game that I played with Eric, it was cut out, are the time moves. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally believe that that is one of the most important rules in the premier rules that not mm -hmm. that that takes care of command control it takes care of many other things and mm -hmm. what i notice is when people have unlimited amounts of time to make a move you end up with a front line that looks like world war one it's just solid troops all the way across mm -hmm. if you only have six or seven minutes to move a core you're going to do the things that are important you're going to make some mistakes uh, and you maybe aren't going to be moving your whole army. I mean, I mm -hmm. first, I'm not a very good tactical player. Monty and Jim are much better than I am. And in six or seven minutes, I can basically move a division, but mm -hmm. I can't, I can't move a core well. So I think people, and that's one way you can adjust the, uh, the level of, uh, if you have players that are new, and you have players that are skilled, grizzly old people like maybe I am, mm -hmm. then you can say, well, we're giving the educated people, the people that have played all the time, they get five minutes. The other people get eight or nine or 10 minutes. And it, it tends mm -hmm. to even things out a little bit. Mm. In the other rules, in the other rule sets, that, which you know there, there have been many iterations and, and maybe that will continue and so forth, I see people add in a lot of detail uh, that I'm not, I don't think necessarily lends itself to that level of the game that we're playing. I do see some things that will help if you're playing, if you're playing solitaire, mm -hmm. some of the chip pulls and things like that. 
uh, could help you out if you're playing solitaire because you know it's hard to fake yourself out, right? You know what you're going to do, <laughs> mm -hmm. but if you're, you're pulling some chits and doing that, I, I see some I see some value in doing that in solitaire. But getting together and playing and playing a battle through in a in several nights that you'll need to do it anyhow, and keeping the pace up. When you play with time moves, you have to watch. Your turn isn't the most important thing. My turn isn't the most important thing to me. It's your turn. I am watching intently what you're going to do, and I am working out the situations in my head. The, the time that I move is merely a mechanic of what I've thought out. So mm. that's, that's one of the views that we have. Uh, people are free. You know, it's, it's almost a free country. People are free to use whatever rule sets. When we played the original Moscova, we had a combination of the rules that are in the game and the mm -hmm. premier rules, and we used the uh, we used the uh, command control rules. And I will tell you that it made zero difference in the way we play. We don't mm. tend to move a lot of troops, you know. Mm. And so, um, uh, so I'm not going to say that you know I don't like this and this and this because of these reasons. Uh, I think people should, you know, there's going to be a group of people that you're going to try to play and they'll have rules and try to work with those. But I, I would encourage people to say, oh, this time moves thing. This is just, you know, kind of uh, elemental. I, I don't want to play that. But try it and you'll see the dynamic that's behind it. That That's really interesting, actually, because I, I had just kind of assumed that that was just a concession to practicality to keep the thing moving, to keep a, an exceptionally noodly player from dragging the entire game down um, with with them, uh, which is, of course, you know, a phenomenon that I'm sure we've all seen from time to time. I hadn't considered it as a, as an element to mo to help model command control issues. That's, that's actually a really fascinating uh, idea. I think I'm not, not, sure i've seen that elsewhere actually at least not in i won't swear that it's never appeared anywhere else but uh but certainly it's it's it seems to not necessarily be a commonly used mechanic or or concept so that's and that's I, actually super duper interesting well and and it comes from i think i read that napoleon once said you know i i have troops and i have soldiers but i never have enough time he never had mm. enough time to you know to be in these decisions that you have to make in split seconds, these things are happening in, you know, in real time, mm -hmm. you're in reality, you're moving and I'm moving and so forth. So we keep it to a reasonable amount of time, but you really have to be, you really have to watch what's going on and it keeps people's heads in the game. There's not mm -hmm. too many people talking about how they got a bad hamburger over there at the, at the fry station at the uh, Columbus food court. They're really mm -hmm. looking at what you're doing and you look at what everybody's doing and how reserves are being moved and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it, it when you have the time and you can set something that's reasonable for you, if it's 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever you want to do. But uh, with that constraint, you will see the level of the game and the people playing it jump several notches over just mm. kind of saying well okay it's your turn and i'll go for lunch and when i come back you know then i'll make my move no you're really watching what people do because you have to be able to react to it and you only have so much time to mechanically move so many mm -hmm. troops so mm -hmm. i'll make my pitch for that and say just give it a try that's that's uh, really interesting so i mean obviously playing like a full game preferably a large game in my case because that's just how i roll um uh, it, under the premier rules is 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 definitely on my to do my wargaming to do list. Uh, I guess let's leave the mechanical conversation behind as we kind of wind toward a conclusion for the show here. Um, but uh, by I guess I'll I'll observe that as as other folks have pointed out, right? That even though this it looks confusing from the outside, if you haven't kind of talked through how the different rules are different. The fact that different rule sets exist for Labatai that are in many ways similar, but are also significantly different in other ways is, is kind of a strength of the uh, Labatai ecosystem, if you think about it, because you can kind of pick the one that you like the best um, and, and well, roll with that. If, you, if you're playing solitaire all the time, it may make the most sense to run with one of the chit pull games, for example. Yeah, and a lot of and, people do. 
and maybe you can see something you like the premiere rules but there's one part of it you would like to try something from another mm -hmm. rule set feel you know we we encourage people to you know mm -hmm. whatever rules you want to you bought the game and we'll support what we have and we'll answer any questions about the rules that are with us if you're using ed's rules you got to add as ask ed the question about them i i didn't write them but there are maybe things that you want to pluck out of some other game and try mm -hmm. it in this game, or there may be some things in our game that you want to try and put in one of the other games. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, like you said, it's you, you it's your game now. Do what mm -hmm. you want with it, mm -hmm. right? If you like the, if you really got to have those ammo wagons in, in the game, there's a rule for that. You just bring that in and use it wherever you want. Well, I, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, uh, and 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 it's a level two of how far do you take stuff like that? Mm -hmm. You know, you have the ammo wagons. Do we figure out the bread rations? You know, we mm. can make a whole game on logistics. You, you know, could. That, that's that's a whole game unto itself. You have the battle. Okay, the really the important part is the logistics, and we can create mm -hmm. a whole game about that to make sure everybody has shoes, bread, bullets, and so forth. And if you can't do that, it really doesn't matter. You're winning the battle. You're just going to run out of stuff. <laughs> I might be interested in such a game, but it definitely would not be La Bataille, now would it? <laughs> so it would be La, La Wagon or something like that. Well, yeah, La, whatever La supply. Su whatever supply. I don't speak French. La baggage German, train. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Monty and Jim took French in high school. I speak German, and I, you know I use it in business and stuff. But but yeah, you could have a whole logistic game. I mean, that's why they needed to take Danzig mm -hmm. so that then the, then they could they could bring ships in rather than wagons cross country and they could supply all the French. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you could that, that that that's certainly certainly wide open. The cavalry rules, I'll say on Mount St. Jean, you probably get a little spoiled uh, because because of the wet ground. And the rules mm -hmm. that are there, you don't get the extra movement with the cavalry and so mm -hmm. forth. But if you get to some place that's dry, the cavalry can get pretty wicked. Some of the hussars, mm -hmm. they can get pretty wicked as far as charging. If you're not, mm -hmm. if you're if you're just moving out infantry over the open country in the uh, if the ground's dry and you get to use all of the cavalry rules that are there, you you, you would have a tough time surviving. Hmm. You know, you oh. got to have you got to have the combined arms. So just when you go into these other battles, it's just a warning for you that in the with the mud in Mount St. Jean, it kind of tones down the cavalry a little bit. Hmm. That's 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 makes perfect sense, actually, considering the con the ground conditions on the day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I look forward to exploring that in future Lava Tide games. And I mean, you guys got me on the hook now, right? I was, I wasn't really uh, like, like a, like a naysayer, but I was like, oh man, this looks really confusing, and I, you know, I don't know. But then you actually start looking at it, and actually playing it, it plays cleanly. Uh, somebody asked about the D sixty six mechanic, and I, I think there was some talk about this at Buckeye Game Fest that I was not party to. So, so for those who don't know, some of the roles in Labatai use what I'll call a D66 mechanic, where there's a 10s D6 and a 1s D6. So you're generating result from 11 to 66. Um, and then you, you know, put whatever DRMs you, you need to put on there, and, and then you look the result up on the appropriate chart, and off you go. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's that's a mechanic, I, the D66 thing... And the reason I call it D66 is because it's used in role-playing games, and, and that's, it, that's what it's called there. Um, I won't say I've never seen that in war games, but it's pretty unconventional mechanic. So so was there like a genesis of that, or was you know was there a decision that was made? Is that does that date all the way back to Larry in 1975? It dates back to the to the first game when we were playing. You know, we expanded Borodino from the divisional mm -hmm. level to the battalion. And then we looked at all these different things that are happening. And we mm -hmm. said, well, just, uh, you know, one, uh, two through 12 doesn't give us enough, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't give us enough different results. And most people have what? They have two six sided items. Okay. So I said, well, what if we do this in base six? You know, where the, the yellow die is the tens, and the other die, the white die, is the units. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now you have all kinds of different possibilities, and it mm -hmm. really opens up the variety. We like to see a lot of variety, 
And we also like to see that there's nothing that's an absolute certain thing. There's always mm -hmm. little things that no matter how brilliant you are, how you outnumber the mm -hmm. other guy, there's little things that can go wrong. Those come up in those kinds of percentage roles I when totally you have that when you have that that many that many possibilities. Mm -hmm. And yet you I didn't totally you didn't have it. to go to like two ten sided die. Most people don't have that, but most people have two six sided ones. And there you go. If anybody watching tonight does not have two ten sided dies. Please email me. I will mail you two 10 sided dice. Okay. Because I got a whole drawer full of them. I'm just saying. But we, no, you're, you're absolutely right, though. We, I, and I totally saw this happen. And fortunately, in this case, shockingly, it was in my favor. Where, you know, we're, we're, we're moving the whole French line forward in the center against, you know, pretty good British troops. Um, I send the French in for an assault. They get absolutely cut to pieces. Uh, there's artillery hitting them. There's, there's the, in the, on the fire roll. They took tons of losses. And then when the time came with the, you know, but they managed to get that far. And when the time came to make that melee roll, 65. And I was yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. may have heard that from the next table over. Yeah. So, so we, I managed to absolutely smash and rout uh, a British unit that looked like it was facing like three French guys and a, and a bag of flour at that point. Uh, but they somehow managed to scare the British off. So yeah, the, 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 you're, again, you're, you're right. It, it kind of bears fruit uh, when you see the, the way the system produces mechanical, you know, descriptive results through the mechanics. Um, there, there's, there's that degree of uncertainty and unpredictability. We didn't get it. We didn't know. And, you know, it swung the other way too, where I rolled five, uh, I think five or six consecutive ones on the tens D six for other stuff so that was yeah. a, a, it's all the, the attack it's went all, nowhere that turn yeah it's all mathematical percentages um that's, did, that's now, what they say you, i believe it's evil spirits uh, okay okay i you know you check those dice and see if what yeah. side's heavy now that's on that true. 65 did you get a leader casualty on the other uh, side there was no leader in either ha uh oh. no no but i did have uh there was no leader in the uh, british hex i think i actually had salt in the hex though Oh wow! Uh, he's given me a little extra juice on the attack. He doesn't well, got they, nothing they, else to do. So you, the way the Marie Louise works. Yeah. Well, I mean, you rolled the sixty-five, so maybe you gave him the juice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. So, but yeah, I mean, that that I I felt like that was like I said I've seen it before, but it's it's very unconventional in wargaming, and and it's. As much as I think, I, th I think a lot of us probably do have D10s now, but in, certainly in 1975, that was weird, right? Uh, the only place you were getting those was from Luzaki or yeah. from a D&D &D set or from, um, or, or if you were buying them directly from the educational supplier that TSR was buying them from. And that mm -hmm. was it. Um, you and remember then? Did that, you ever those, deal, did you ever deal with Lou? Oh, I've met Lou on a number of occasions. Yeah, I bought uh, I bought dice from him many times. Certainly, yeah, yeah. Um, he has a convention, uh, uh, you know, convention icon uh, for his famous, and it's this is on YouTube where with Lou giving like the ten minute dice pitch about his how his dice are better than everybody else's dice. And, you know, <laughs> I I was standing there for that pitch one time, and I sure walked away with a set of Lou's dice. So so well, Lou's good at it, and we wish him the best. I have a superstition when I go to conventions and play is that I always buy new dice from one of the sellers. Mm -hmm. I won't I won't use dice that I've used before. That's my superstition, and it served me well. Maybe I should try that because I, I take the opposite approach where I try to build up the karma in the dice. <laughs> and it, you know, I at 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 Buckeye Game Fest, I felt like I had a statistically average performance i think i rolled a lot of high rolls a lot of low rolls and a lot of rolls in the middle and it nothing stuck out to me but but i did have a couple of lucky rolls at opportune times and that's that's when it's great except when it's not because it's the other player rolling the opportune roll at the opportune but time. but but each side will get those you'll all, each side will yeah go through zones or time when they they can't roll anything, and then they'll get in streaks where they can roll really well, and so the battle ebbs and flows with all of those things. Yes, uh, my problem is that I if I have a streak if I have a streak, it lasts for like four years, 
So uh, I, I, it's absolutely shameful die rolling performances from me. Anyway, um, if anybody has any final questions for Dennis, please throw them in the chat right now because we are we are moving toward wrapping this up after an hour and forty five minutes. Um, so congrats to Perry who has already sent me his information. As soon as we're done here, I'll send that over to to Dennis and James, and they can get that out to you, Perry. So again, congrats. Um, uh, here's a great question, and uh, maybe I can actually answer this because I'm we're, we're trying. Are there any regular Lavatai conventions? Um, I know that it, it always gets played at Tempe, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we usually have a separate room, mm -hmm. and then there's a couple played in there. And many times uh, we've we've previewed our latest game by playing it at Tempe. Mm -hmm. um, so. But I don't know if there's I don't know that there's an exclusive convention. I mean, you had a nice room set up uh, at the Buckeye Fest there, and there was a lot going mm -hmm. on, and we had those mm -hmm. two games. And if we hadn't had a couple people get ill at the last moment, we would have had mm -hmm. the the Heilsberg game going on at the mm -hmm. same time. So that would have been three La Batia games right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and. I mean, as I, I, like I said I, in email, I have not had a conversation with. Actually, I think I have now. At least talked to them in passing about it, uh, about how uh, Marshall Enterprises. You guys were, you know, wrote me a very nice note about it. I passed passed, you know, the the, the thanks along and to them, and they do they do all the actual work. I just talk to people, right? Um, so uh, as far as I'm concerned, you guys are welcome to come back to Buckeye Game Fest every year, and we can make Labatt Fest a permanent fixture there. We've got the space. We've got the audience locally because there's a there's a you know there's we can always wrangle enough people for at least one Labatai game just from Columbus, Ohio. Let me put it well. And, and and you know I'm in Detroit, so I'm not that mm -hmm. far away. So I it was very convenient for me. Jim mm -hmm. flew flew to my house and drove with me down there, which worked out well too. So mm -hmm. uh, you know I I very much enjoyed the convention and everything. The, well, I had one bad thing happen when we were checking subway? out. We, no, 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 no. We were checking out of the Hilton. Uh, there was a Hampton Inn across the street where mm -hmm. we stayed. Mm -hmm. And we went to leave and we didn't know that there was a marathon going on. And so we were in the center of the marathon and every street we tro tried to drive down, the police said, no, you got to go down here. And we were uh -huh. working our way around the clock. Till finally, I convinced a policeman that there was a break, and these were just walkers. They weren't runners anymore, and then he let us out of there. But it took us, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes to try to get out of this maze. So that was my only, that was my only minor negative. If it makes you feel any better, I also had no idea there was a marathon that day. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it wasn't just you. I'm like, is that a marathon down there? I'm like, what? What's with the music? And the, 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 I don't understand. My my uh, first hint. My first hint was when they were unloading all of the porta potties, and I said, oh, "Wow!" I, I saw the girls doing volleyball, and there's the uh -huh. gamers, but the plumbing inside should be able to handle them. What's going on here? <laughs> You'd think, yeah. No, I yeah, I didn't even see that. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the main drag in Columbus. And if there is anything, and for some reason there is a preponderance of parades held during gaming conventions held at that facility. Let me mm -hmm. put it that way. This is not the only parade or marathon or whatever. The Origins every year, uh, for example, which is at that so you may may or may not have gone over to the convention center side, the enormous convention center that's connected to that hotel. But I've been going there since 1995. So I've okay. been in that. And that's not the only event I've been to there, actually. So I've probably been in that convention center 30 times. Um, and usually there's a there's either a like a street festival called Comfest or or the Columbus Pride Parade is the, one of those two things is often on the same weekend as Origins. So that was a very funny story when we me and a bunch of my friends came down from Cleveland and had no idea that was going on. And we, walked out of the convention center one day and said, Hey, look, a parade, what's going on? So there was a, there was confusion, but, uh, I would like to thank, uh, let's say big thanks to Marshall enterprises for, for, for sitting down with us tonight, Dennis, I'd love to have you on again at some point. And if a, a great time might be when you're getting ready to release, uh, your, your next game, whatever that will be. Okay. I, I really enjoyed it. And again, 
uh, the Buckeye Fest was uh, was a great event. I, I mm -hmm. Jim and I both thought that we had a good time. Mm -hmm. Let me let me get to Nordic Maelstrom's question here because he's asked it at least twice in the chat, and I don't want to blow him off. Um, if you had advice, I'll reframe it, of course. But if you had to give advice to somebody, uh, you know, a, a young sprout came up to you and said, "Hey, I'm thinking about designing uh, and publishing a game." Or, you know, just maybe just even creating a game. What, what advice would you give them? Well, I, if you look at the pattern that we had, what we did is we, we, we had to get noticed by the public. And you have, I would say, create a web page mm -hmm. and have your information on there and maybe your game on there and then mm -hmm. publicize it and get people to know your company. Maybe go to a, a convention or two. And then once people know who you are and they maybe have seen your product and can go to your page and see uh, if, if this is the kind of thing that they like. And there's a lot of things you can put on these pages that are humorous or have to do with history. We had one picture of the Pope being levitated and so forth. But oh. anyhow, well, you know, it can happen. But I would do that and then engage. If you If you come out and just publish a game and nobody's ever heard of you or they, they don't know where to find information about you, then I think it would be really difficult. Then once you have kind of a following, say you do a year in the minor leagues of getting things together, then take mm -hmm. a look at publishing uh, something. One thing I, I would also think would be a good idea, I don't work alone. And every idea that I have isn't a good idea. Sometimes Monty has to talk me down off the ledge. So, so I think it's important to have partners and partners that you can trust to say bad things about their, their, uh, say bad things about what you've created and why, and you're not hurt. You take mm -hmm. it the right way. Uh, maybe you're mad for a little while, but I think it's important to engage with other people, small number. So if you can get a few people to work with you and then there's a writer, there's somebody that knows something about graphics, and then there's somebody working on the game, and then the three of you can bring that together. One person, it, it's it's very, very difficult, and it's so easy to go down the wrong path if just one person is working on something. Well, as a one-man operation over here, uh, I can totally say that you're totally right. It would be so much easier if I had coll actual collaborators, and I kind of do, but I mean, at the same time, it's, you know, I completely get what you're saying. And sometimes you won't see the mis your own mistakes until they're in the rearview mirror. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes a collaborator can point those those mistakes out to you before you commit to them. So I, I completely agree. And with the internet, it's so much easier now. Yeah. Look at the way uh, Jim is in Los Angeles, Monty's in San Diego, I'm in Detroit, and we collaborate all the time. We send, we're sending right now maps back and forth that Monty's looking at for the next game. Mm -hmm. with uh with different things on it so it's so much easier now but maybe go to a convention and play with some people in the area world war ii or whatever and try to find some people who might be interested in working with you mm -hmm. yeah they're they're out there right find some people with whom you share uh the passion for the topic uh if i found always found that that's totally key for for war gamers and historical games especially i suppose it's true of like sci-fi and fantasy stuff as well but I mean, you. I think I think we're all kind of doing this out of passion for the history, right? I mean, oh, yeah, for sure, at some level. I mean, certainly there are like the competitive people who just do it for the competition, but 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 I don't game with those people. Yeah. Um, they can play, have fun. They can. I, I wish them the best of luck and and the uh -huh. best possible experiences. But I, that's not what I'm doing this for. So to me, it's all about the uh, interest in the topics, right? And uh, uh -huh. you're going to take some blame for my recent surge of interest in Napoleonic topics, I'm afraid. Well, no, that's, oh. it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's something we got inspired by when we saw the rush. I know Jim and I, when we saw the, the, uh, Russian version of war and peace and so mm -hmm. forth. And it just, I was a world war two guy, you know, and then mm -hmm. I saw all this stuff and, and I just, it just clicked and I got into it and I abandoned everything else. And so, uh, you know, it just fascinated me, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. All the politics are going, why are why are all these nations against Napoleon? You know, mm -hmm. it's just that he's he's not a nice guy or what what's the deal? Why did he crown himself? 
you know, take the crown from the Pope and put it on his head. Why are, why, what do all these things mean? They all are a symbol or there's all a reason behind what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, I, I, I love it. It's a fascinating period. And well, well, maybe that's a topic we can, the, just the fascination of the Napoleonic period is, is something we can explore at a later time. So, okay. so once again, finally, Dennis, thanks so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. Thanks for, uh, you know, being generous with the, with the giveaway of, of a copy of Halsbury. That's fantastic. Very, we're all very happy for Perry. I had to pay for mine, Perry. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I didn't get a free copy. I'm just saying I paid for mine. Yeah, that's fine. But I'm just saying Perry gets a free copy. And I'm not bitter about it at all. Just uh, let me ask: Does does Perry have a show? No, he, uh, not as far as I'm aware. Because, <laughs> guys, well, if you want to talk about people with shows, I could I could have that conversation too. But that is wow. not tonight's conversation either. So once again, uh, all right. audience has been great. We were up, we were head to head against the Compass Expo show, and we I, I'm very happy with our numbers. Let me put it that way. Um, so I'd like to thank for Marshall Enterprises, uh, both Dennis and and James for uh, for helping out with this. I'd like to thank everybody for watching, um, and I wish everybody a great night. We'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.